Got it? Ready? Yeah, let's do it. We're going to go ahead and get started. So if you want to make your way over and get comfortable. Okay. Welcome to the assemblage. We're so excited to have you here tonight. I wanted to give you a few house rules before we got started. One, if you're going to use the bathroom, please use the ones back by these exit signs. These ones are a little bit noisy. And like I said, there's food to order from the cafe. And we also have an elixir bar on the 12th floor after, and you guys are all invited to join us. Um, I'm assuming this is most of your first time at the assemblage. Is that true? 
Yes. Yes. Okay. So just to give you guys a little bit of context about where you are, um, we are co-working, co-living social space that is really designed to support our members in fulfilling their mission through our programming, through our wellness classes, through our Ayurvedic food, and through our community. We have this building is 12 floors, so we definitely encourage you to explore after. Um, we have two more buildings opening in the next year. Our next one is in Wall Street in March, which has um, a hotel as well. Um, and our programming is really just designed to support our members in fulfilling the highest version of themselves and is really around technology and consciousness. So super happy to have you here. Super happy to have Dan here and enjoy. Thank you. You guys can hear me? Wow, that's really loud. It's better? You got this. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming out today. Yeah. And I would like to thank the uh, assemblage hosts for, for, for their gracious support and for providing us this really amazing space. Yeah. So um, just a quick introduction of myself. I am, uh, my name is Kevin Chen. I am an evangelist at the IOTA Foundation. And um, so some of my works, including uh, business development as well as uh, adoption strategy. And I'd like to give a really quick uh, overview about uh, what IOTA is about. But uh, before going that, I'd like to uh, ask a couple questions. Um, who owns uh, Bitcoin? Who owns IOTA? Who, who wants to own some IOTA, but is having trouble too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So another announcement is that we ha do have a uh, new wallet that's coming out. At least it's going to be in beta in a, in a few weeks. And it, looks, and it looks really nice. Yeah. So um, just a quick uh, overview for, about IOTA is IOTA is a uh, cryptocurrency that is for the uh, Internet of Things and machine-to-machine -machine, uh, Transactions, and uh, some of our use so some of our use cases is more for uh, industrial purposes such as uh, mobility, uh, smart cities, supply chain, and also healthcare, which we have uh, two speakers will be presenting, and um, going going through that, um, I like to uh, introduce to my uh, our co-organizer Dan. Oh, cool. Yeah. Hi, I have like a quick little thing here. So, um, like Kevin said. You know, IOTA is a really interesting cryptocurrency, but even more so than that, it's a really interesting piece of technology, right? And one of the reasons why we're putting these events on and why we're, um, you know, we're going to have monthly events, I encourage you all to come back, is that we really want to show how these technologies are being used, right? Because there are a lot of people who initially get um, uh, blindsided, right, by, hold on, how do I find this? Uh... Alexi, how do I find the my little two three slides? Are they hiding here? Okay, um, you know it's really it's really easy to get blindsided by like oh there's this thing called Bitcoin and you can like buy it on Coinbase and you can make a lot of money but kind of once you take a step back or a step further and you see that um, you know there's this thing called a distributed ledger and it's allowing all these technologies to be built on top of it. So we actually have two developers here uh, or two projects that are actually building on top of the IOTA uh, protocol. And they're going to be talking about how they're doing it, what the challenges are, why it's exciting, and why they're doing it. So very, very cool. And on my end, um, that's kind of what I'm working on right now is there is the education side. Yes, the investing is really cool, but also kind of the technology. So on my end, I have a, um, I have a org called New Ledger. And New Ledger kind of to that end, we're working on, so we're an incubator, we're actually building POCs so that we can actually try this technology out in the wild and see what it looks like and how people respond to it. Uh, so if you're building a POC, or if you're in this space, or if you want to talk about kind of how to build them, you can come to me and we can, we can talk about it. Uh, happy to kind of lend a hand. And then also kind of on the broader education side, like with organizations, we're going in there and kind of giving them this behind the scenes look at how they can revolutionize their uh, organizations in this space. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Is that better? Okay. It's a very cozy space in here. It's easy to forget that. Uh, so, like, one POC that um, is coming out of this project is called, like, Co-Ledger. So, Co-Ledger, we're looking at implementing IOTA in the supply chain space, right? So, you know, sometimes it's you go online and you look at all these very abstract concepts, like, uh, oh, like, EOS is being announced, but what does it do? Or IOTA is being announced, like, how does it work? Um, 
you know, actually applying them in a real-world application is what we're looking to do. So we can show you what the next two years are going to look like in a technological landscape where distributed ledgers are being enabled. Um, so quickly, if you ever want to, uh, if you want to message me or if you want to Twitter, um, some good ways to get at us to kind of like continue this conversation because it is this kind of global community um, that is looking to kind of revolutionize so many things, uh, not just kind of finances or exchanging value, but everything that really uh, distributed ledgers have to offer. So uh, with that in mind, I'm going to introduce our two. We've got two presentations tonight. We've got Alexi and we've got Ben. And Ben is going to come first. I'll let him introduce himself. And here's Ben. Cool. All right, let's get started. Hello. Hi. Hello. <laughs> oh, quick thing too. We're going to have all Q&A after, and we're going to have plenty of time to kind of all chat and get together and talk so you can connect. Awesome. I'm good. Hello. My name is Ben Royce. Um, this is the project I'm working on, Debut M Health. Um, this is an implementation, of course, of... Uh, IOTA in healthcare. How did I get here? What am I doing here? Um, I started a rural telemedicine project with a doctor and that led to Internet of Things to implement that. And I fell into IOTA after IOT and I fell in love with it. It's, it's great. Why is IOTA so great? Um, no mining, no fees, scales, speedy. So I saw a lot of, because we talk a lot about distributed ledger technology and the promises of it, but there's a lot of hurdles in that. IOTA gets over some of those. So with Internet of Things, that's a natural fit for IOTA, but there are other applications beyond the Internet of Things. Electronic health records is what I'm pursuing. There's, there's I mean, there's a gigantic number of projects out there. Um, this is just one. Lexi will have another one. So towards a debut protocol. So what am I building? I'm building a protocol to put healthcare records onto IOTA, onto the Tangle. First, the bad news. Patients don't necessarily care about their health records. We all own our health records, but we don't get that involved with managing them. So a lot of this technology that allows you to manage your records is really groundbreaking and really far thinking in the things you can do with it. But most people, they just, you know, it's the doctor handles it, they sign some forms, forget about it. However, perhaps we're going to open up some new possibilities and people begin to think about what they can do with their health records. I mean, one of the, a lot of th things they talk about on IOTA is with um, monetizing your own data. We live in a world where Facebook is monetizing us. Why is Facebook monetizing us? Why aren't we monetizing our own data? Um, there is ethical considerations with monetizing healthcare data, but if we're talking about from the point of view of the patient owning their own data, then now we're talking about something, all sorts of things. This may be one little thing. Um, if it's an app on your phone, aiming for effortlessness so that the patient doesn't have to worry that much as they do nowadays with paperwork and all that crazy thing at the doctor's office. If it's easy and straightforward, then maybe the patient can begin to embrace some of these changes. Data silos, um, that's a big problem. Again, like with Facebook owning all of our data, the people that own your healthcare data, why would they want to share that? Why would, why would it make sense for them? So we can talk about maybe from a company's point of view, this is not such a great idea. But maybe from, again, the individual point of view, but also the government point of view, HIPAA, that's the, uh, anyone know what HIPAA is? <laughs> Nineteen ninety six. That's good. It's 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 basically just sort of saying, you know what? Why are doctors faxing each other? It's nineteen ninety six. Now it's even twenty eighteen. They're still faxing each other. But why are we still doing this? And this, hopefully, at this level, at the HIPAA level, they will embrace that vision and say, yeah, you're right. You know, you know, we'll see how it goes. Does anyone remember this? 
January? I don't know, am I totally blocking everybody's view over here? <laughs> hey, I'll stand over here, sorry. Does anyone remember this announcement? I feel like Mr. Rogers. <laughs> I don't look like him, I need a sweater, but. <laughs> so, does anyone remember this announcement? So Apple is trying to do, well, they have a little more financial you know, backing them than I do, but they're trying to do the same thing. They're trying to put healthcare records, you know, onto, not onto the tangle, but to move it into the, the next generation. Um, I wish them luck. They've got a great little app. Um, they team it up with a bunch of providers, but will consumers engage? Will they get involved? Patients, unfortunately, are they going to be motivated to do that? And that's why I have this slide. This is a cautionary tale. Does anybody remember Google Health? No. Yeah. <laughs> really, nobody does. <laughs> Maybe not even people that work there. But it was a cautionary tale. It's completely driven by consumer engagement, and it, you know, it was dead in the rival because it involves the patient engaging and doing this themselves. And that's just, it's, you know, is, is Apple going to be able to do this? We'll see. I hope they do. I really do. It's better if it goes on a tangle, but um, I mentioned uh, HIPAA and things work at the federal level. I mentioned, but new competition has strange consequences. I was wondering why I wrote that. I wrote that because of these guys. Maybe you've heard this announcement. This is, this is well, all of us. Em employers, employees were fed up with healthcare in, in the United States. I mean, the, it's just crazy. And these guys are getting together and saying, okay, why do we even need you? Why don't we just do it all ourselves? So, and why I'm bringing this up is, Again, the question is, how do you introduce IOTA into the modern American healthcare landscape? How do you do that? You can't really approach it from the company point of view and their little data silos. Apple is trying that. It's hard. You can't really approach it from the consumer point of view, but maybe you can approach it at this level of these new guys who want to introduce something compelling and earth-shattering and changing the world with DLT, which we're all trying to do. Um, or at the, again, the federal level, because they are interested in making our healthcare records portable and easy to use and easy to access. Um, although, to get serious about HIPAA, you know, there are very serious rules about privacy, security, and data storage, and DLT is, what are you talking about? Why, we're not, you know, they're, they're, it's going to be little nibbles. It's going to be little trials. It's going to take a while to get there. It's not just going to be, hey, we're going to put everyone's healthcare records on the tangle. No, you're not. That's, you know, it's, un it's lots of problems. But, you know, if we get little trials going in the future, maybe we can start talking about this. Because, I mean, again, why I mention that? Because DLT really is a perfect fit for what they want to do at the governmental level. They want our healthcare records to be easy to access. They don't want people to repeat tests. They don't want people to, you know, oh, I, I, I moved all my records. I don't know. And then it's just this bureaucratic nightmare. If we can make it portable, heck, cross country, across the world, where your records just sort of effortlessly follow you, I mean, that's, that's what we're all aiming for. And I, I brought this slide up. This is sort of a, uh, this slide was actually two separate issues. Um, I, and there, if, if it doesn't move forward in the United States, so what am I going to do with my little project? Well, there's lots of countries that use HL7. I, I didn't even mention what HL7 is. Did, I, did anyone know what HL7 is? Okay, that's health level seven. That is pretty much a standard way that electronic health records are transmitted. Like, you, you know, you take a pulse ox reading, you... You get admitted to the hospital, things like that. That's the verbiage. Um, Sorry, I'm trying to just turn off. Yeah, you can keep going. Oh. <laughs> um, I mentioned how a phone app, really everything, everything is a phone app nowadays, and it really should be because it's almost like, I mean, I call it a problem area because, and somebody out there smarter than me, please figure this out. If we can have some way to establish identity in a good way 
it's just, you know, it's earth shattering. It'll change everything. But so you have all your, your access to your records through your phone. Uh, may be able, to, be able to grant and revoke access to providers. Uh, I have some schemes coming up later um, that I want to talk about with that. How to, um, it would phone app to maybe organize your, your, your records by type and condition and all that sort of thing. Um, and then the last thing segues into the next issue of how you, I'm going to get a little technical. Maybe some people will like that, maybe not. Um, how do you actually get health records onto the Tangle? I mean, that's, some of you know about this. It's called mass authentication messaging. Um, I said that you, DICOM radiology files will not be stored in the Tangle. They're rather huge. You probably want to just have a little credential that goes on there. This is what I'm actually trying to do now. I won't get into it deeply, but I'm trying to actually put HL7 records on the, the Tangle. Um, just so just briefly, a little technical overview of what I'm doing. You, how it works is you, you, you publish a key to a private stream. So you, it's just a, it's a radio station that only people you give a little invite out to can listen to. Um, I, I, one of the schemes I'm trying to do is this gets a little uh, crazy for me because I'm not a cryptographer, but I'm getting a lot into it lately. Yikes. Um, some records, okay, you know, Alice and Bob, Alice has a record, she can access it. Um, it's not multi-key where two people need to have a key to access the record. It's more like either or. So Alice can access the record with her key or Bob can use his key. I'm talking about the patient or the hospital. So I'm trying to figure out how to do that on MAM because it's really just one key. Um, not all the I'm talking about scenarios. What scenarios I'm talking about? That's what I'm going to do next. This is some of the scenarios of how health records will actually go onto the tangle. Not all of them will make sense. Some regulars are not like. Um, you have to think about. This is something I'm trying to wrap my head around. Zero value transactions. Anyone know what I'm talking about? So yeah, you know, an iota here's 500 iota, and you give me 50 or whatever it is. What are zero value transactions? Well, these are just healthcare records. So they're going to have a value? What, what, how is that going to work? Or is that part of the incentivization process? What's going on here? with it? So I have to think about how that's going to work. And that's actually what the next slide is, I think. OK, who is consuming the stream? What does this mean? How, how does, so you have a patient and your records are going onto the tangle. How is it working? How are they organized and how are they consumed? So this is just a simple stream. See, here's some healthcare records. It's going to stream, just a radio station. You get a key. The key allows anyone you give it to to read your medical records. It's obviously this fits in security here. Um, if anyone can access, you just give them a key. Doctors, maybe relatives who are legally empowered to deal with you if you're incapacitated in a hospital. Um, why examine this? Well, it's just to introduce the concept and also to know that we're not limited to just one use case scenario. There's other countries that might have different ways of doing things, other organizations. So what's another way that healthcare records can go onto the tangle? Um, this is what I'm talking about with two keys. So what's going on here? I have access to my records naturally. They're my healthcare records. At the same time, a medical provider, any medical provider, this is again, you know, problematic, can also have access automatically. Although, let's say you're in an emergency room, you don't want to. Remember, we're not talking about the old world of records where they're just somewhere and somebody says, he's in the ER, we need those records. Can you get them to me? This is, you know, this is distributed ledger technology. There is no back door, there is no, the feds know it, they can grab it. It's yours. You know what I mean? And there's no other way to get to it. So how is that going to work? So this is what the, the whole double key thing I was talking about, because medical providers have to be able to access it. Um, and also, like I said three times already, patients just don't care. So yes, these are medical records. Please, your doctor, access them. Do what you need to know to treat me. Finally, this is, I, this is where I think it's going to be at. Um, patients and a white list of allowed medical providers. So you're a patient, you have access, but now you're going to say, yes, 
this hospital in Dallas, you can also access my record. Uh, my dermatologist, please, you can access my record. You literally manage your records and grant them and take them back. Um, how do you do that? Are there many keys? Are there a key for each granting and revocation? Or do you have just one key and someone is removed from this white list, you just throw out the new key and hand out everyone left a new key saying, this, you are now the new group who has access to my records. This is most likely, I think, how it's gonna work. I mean, it, you can move to a new state or a country, because a lot of countries do the HL7, and it's just um, it's very easy to manage compared to our status quo nowadays where people still faxing things. All right, now I write what stream? Well, what am I talking about? So I'm talking about a stream of medical records. Um, just one. Why just one? The many different kinds of medical records. So now you're talking about different ways to access a stream, and now you're talking about different streams of records. And why am I talking about that? Again, this is all just exploring what can IOTA, what can the Tangle do for healthcare? What are some of the use cases? What are just some of the, the promise out there? So one patient is many streams. This is just one of the streams. It's only some of his records, not all of his medical records. Completely public. Anyone can view it. Why? Some people just are exhibitionists. They want to show their heart rate. I'm a great marathoner. I'm losing weight. I really should lose some weight. I want to show the world my weight loss progress. All those fun things. Here's another stream from an individual managing his own health records. Quasi-public records. So this is either voluntary or automatic, let's say from the feds. This is saying that a country may, let's say, get diagnosed with influenza. Well, really, the feds should know that because you really want to track what's happening with a disease outbreak. You want to see, oh, look at this diagnostic code, looking at it popping up in this area at this rate, look at the severity of the complications from it. So I'm talking about sort of a, a quasi-public stream based on diagnosis, maybe. Uh, I thought about, okay, well, what do you do? Do you key off the diagnosis? No, I'm thinking maybe the, the diagnosis probably gets a trigger, you know what I mean? To this key is important for this record or for this patient, this issue. So here's another fractional stream of someone's records. Um, completely private records. These are your health records. If you don't want anyone to see them, no one should see them. You went to the plastic surgeon, nobody has to know that. Nobody sees this, maybe not even your primary care physician. Um, people do that under fake name, but it's, it's not necessarily so, so safe. And Miguel is sorry, he can't make it. <laughs> sorry, I'm just gonna, I got this, I'm sorry. <laughs> Miguel, you should be here. I don't even know why they're going there. No, it's funny, though. I don't think you can. You should be able to close. I think if Miguel is going to be texting now, I think the whole world should see what Miguel is saying. Don't you think so? So actually, you know, I know we said no questions before, but I'm sure some people are kind of looking at this and going, well, don't we have systems that can do this now? Like, like what makes what makes using or leveraging IOTA as the tangle and maybe we need to talk a little bit more about like what that is. Maybe yes. that's a context or maybe I'm sorry. Thing. Yeah. Like, well, like why? Like I look at this and go, well, there's technology. Can't technology do anything? Why can't it do this? Like, why a distributed ledger? Yes. Now, and, and Alexi will go a lot more into the basics of IOTA. This is, it's, it's useful. It's informational. And then when you understand more of the basics, okay, so this is, you know, the, person just keeping their own. Then this is an interesting concept that you can do with records. You're volunteering. Uh, there's ethical, serious ethical considerations about this, but it, it's either world destroying or wonderful. I'm not sure which yet. The idea that you, that a, a, a company could notice a diagnostic code safe or maybe for good reasons like a study or something or they have a trial of a drug or something or they have an offer and they key off of you conforming to a condition that says yes 
you are someone we want to offer money to be in our study or something like that. Uh, again, people do things for money in this world that is a problematic, so there are very serious ethical considerations here. But this gets into the whole IOTA being a cryptocurrency. Every single transaction actually has a fractional money value. These are health records. How does that work? Well, there's all sorts of ways it works. And then you can publish your entire history in a limited time-dependent context. Say, um, it's important for a legal situation. Um, just review the quality of your health care by another doctor. I grant you this limited review. And then I added a little wink to the future. Maybe you, in AI can review how well your health care is being done and then shortly after they kill us all. But Anyway, that is a brief interview. <laughs> Wait, what'd you say? <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> we'll reveal your health. It's excellent. Now you can die. Um, again, my name was Ben Royce. Um, it's my email. It's my Twitter. Um, you can review and comment at our website. I do have a silent backer, not here, doctor, at de debutmh.com. Thank you very much. And I'm supposed to turn this off, I think. I might take that seat. The Mr. Rogers seat. That's great. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm sorry about the text messages and uh, whatever, but I turned off Wi-Fi, so. Okay, how's everyone doing? Good. Good? All right. So IOTA, the network built for machine-to-machine -machine economies, it's scalable, it's peer-to-peer, -peer, and it's feeless. These are like the three biggest things that you can get out of IOTA. So a little bit about myself. I am a graduate of the Wegman School of Pharmacy in 2012. That's in upstate New York for any of you guys who don't know where that is. Uh, my interest in the Internet of Things began a couple years ago uh, in the spring of 2016. I worked with a developer on, of all things, an energy monitoring system. Um, don't really know what piqued my interest, maybe, maybe because pharmacy is kind of boring. So I got into technology and thinking about, well, if we can gather information on an energy sensor and we can turn that into... Uh, a real value and show how much is being consumed per house or per warehouse, uh, we could then substitute that sensor with any other diagnostic sensor uh, out there. So after IoT, I found IOTA, and it was like, okay, that makes perfect sense. And from there, I also delved into, I think, much like all of you guys here are interested in not just other distributed ledgers like IOTA, but also traditional blockchain and Bitcoin. Um, without Bitcoin, I don't think any of this is would have been possible. So initially, everyone is going to be interested in the traditional technology, the one that started everything else. So what we want to look at is some of the value that cryptography brings, as well as decentralization. Now, for a while, it was difficult even for myself to understand, like, what is so, who cares if it's decentralized? I don't think anyone cares if it's decentralized as long as it works and functions the way that a regular centralized application will work. So until that happens, I don't think anyone's going to really value decentralization, but hopefully by the end of this, I can highlight some of the reasons why you would want to have a decentralized network, especially when it comes to the collection and distribution of information. Uh, I'm also going to talk a little bit about exponential organizations. I don't know if you guys are familiar, but there's a book by Salem Ishmael, and I use that book and the principles from that and apply it to the IOTA Foundation and sort of look at it from that perspective and say, is this an organization that is going to be exponential, and how does it rank 
uh, according to those principles. And the IOTA Evangelist Network, as we mentioned before, or maybe we didn't, but um, I'm also a member of the Evangelist Network. And just so you guys know, I am not a developer. I am not a coder. I am not a computer programmer. I am not anything like that. So for all of you who are not in that category, which hopefully is, I'm assuming most of you, I'm going to give you know, this presentation from your perspective, from the, the way that you want to actually know this information, and that is, how is IOTA going to actually impact my life? Like, what? No one really cares how it works unless it does something that's going to benefit me. Not necessarily me, but just society in general. Okay, so we're going to go through this lightning quick. We're not going to get too uh, involved with this, but just so that we all understand what is the difference between IOTA and other blockchains, we're going to go through what a mesh network is, a directed acyclic graph versus blockchain, and then some of the future direction and implications of uh, the Internet of Things. And then, as I said before, we're going to look at exponential organizations, how that applies to IOTA, and where I believe it will take us in the future. And then I'm going to highlight some proof of concept uh, ideas as well as real world projects that we're working on. But just to stress before we get there, uh, I am not endorsing uh, any of these other companies that I highlight. I just found the coolest technology that I believe will be impacting our life, especially from the pharmacist point of view or from the healthcare point of view, from the pharmaceutical point of view. And I think it's going to be here before we are like ready for it. I think that it's going to happen what feels like overnight because with everything else that we've seen in technology, everything has gotten ridiculously cheap and we're just getting better and better at implementing these solutions. So like cell phones are now, I don't know, who knows how many times more powerful than your traditional computer was like 10 years ago. And then we're going to see that technology be brought to manufacturing and then delivering of medications, I believe. So a mesh network refers to a rich inter... I took this from Wikipedia, by the way. Uh, mesh refers to rich interconnection among devices or nodes. All that means is that there is an internet connection for a device or something that's propagating the network, such as uh, like a router, right? Normally you would think of a router, it's connected to the wall, it's got wireless, uh, you know, in the house. And each, so if you have multiple routers in your house because you need to get better coverage, that just represents a node. That's all a node is. But a node is also something that I look at. It's not necessarily the correct terminology, a node on the IOTA tangle. It's, there can be a transaction that represents maybe a different tip of the tangle. But I'm looking at it from both perspectives. What it looks like from a physical point of view, like the devices that give everyone the internet and then looking at it from the perspective of a transaction within the, the IOTA network, the Tangle. Cloud and edge computing. I think everyone is familiar with cloud computing. You know, there's Amazon Web Services. All you know that there is some supercomputers over in like Virginia and they're keeping up all your data information and you know, Apple has their own cloud and I'm sure you guys are familiar with clouds are. But what the edge is, is I'm going to do the best that I can to describe this, but the best way I can explain it is that there is going to be devices in the future that are going to be collecting information, not even the future, they're here now, where they will be collecting information, processing the, the information that they collect locally, and then before it gets sent to the rest of the network, it's going to have it packaged in a neatly, much more organized fashion so that it's not going to bog down the rest of the network and it's going to be just uh, more easily distributed. And then in the future direction, we're just going to show, I have a graphic to show that though. So these are the different types of networks. The one that we're concerned with is right here in the middle. It's a mesh network. It just shows that the devices are connected from multiple points from one to another and it's got a number of different wireless connections. So you have LoRa, low energy Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, NFC, RFID. If you're not familiar with some of these, uh, I mean, just do a, a Google search. But I'm thinking that pretty much all of those wireless connections are available on your phone. 
except for maybe Laura, and that's it. And so here's a graph that's projecting in the next couple of you know decades in time the number of Internet of Things that are going to be connected to the Internet. And what that means is it's going to be exponentially growing the amount of information that's out there. Um, and there's going to be that. This is important to know only because the way that IOTA works is it does not require a fee in order to transact information. So if you have billions of devices that are communicating hundreds or thousands of times in a day, even the lowest number, like this is the most minimal transaction fee would begin to accumulate and be impossible to scale. So this is a, a protocol that allows for devices to be communicating at speeds and at uh, quantities of time that we could never keep up with, nor could we afford to pay these machines to do this. And then we'll get into a little bit about further about this machine to machine economy where we will get to a point in time where artificial intelligence and machine learning will know better than a human would ever know as far as distributing any goods or services. And so machines will begin to bid with themselves for resources on demand. Just like an Uber ride costs more during certain times in certain areas, you're going to have machines that are going to be uh, basically trading with each other for those resources, and it's going to affect the price. But again, this is, has to happen at a... We can't be in control of that. We can't be doing this as a human. So this will eventually need to be entirely machine to machine and not involve any human intervention. Uh, did I just go backwards? No. Okay, so I just told you. Uh, it's a fee-less transaction model. It does not require you know any fee to do that. It's scalable. I don't want to get into it, but basically the... I could sh I could send you guys out a link. There's a great interview of one of the co-founders, David Sonstebo, gives over the summer. And I must have listened to it a million times so I could truly understand it. But the... Oh, what was he... <laughs> The scalability, he goes through and explains how there is going to be a need for a standardization within the IoT industry. And so the devices that we're going to be putting onto the network now and building out this future with, we need to do it from bef like before we start printing out and making billions of devices, we need to have a standardization now. So he was discussing an, an ASIC processor that would be implanted on IoT devices, but because of the algorithm that is used to propagate like an IOTA transaction, it won't need to be a very powerful ASIC processor. And he further discusses about how it would be a minimal cost to manufacturers of today in order to make this standardization possible. But the good thing is, is that we don't actually need a hardware specific device in order to facilitate these transactions. These can already be taking place right now. But as far as like getting the most out of a chip is concerned, um, he does a much better job explaining, but uh, that, is, that is where we're gonna need to get to, is a standardized approach towards the Internet of Things uh, devices. And so we talked a little bit about what a directed acyclic graph is, or maybe we didn't, but we'll, I'll show you in a second. And the foundation and its partners, mostly what is important about, and we'll, I'll just go to the next slide. This book is the one I was referencing earlier, Salem Ishmael's book. And he discusses all these different topics of how an organization can set itself up and leverage itself to be uh, truly exponential. And community-driven effort, in my opinion, is going to be the way that all of this happens. If we don't adopt it, if this doesn't become used by everyone, not just necessarily by everyone as an individual, but if we can't find partnerships and get people wanting to create and build on this protocol, then it's going to fail. It's, it needs to be propagated like, with people that are interested such as yourselves, such as myself, anyone that wants to further this cause. So 
I highly suggest the book and we can look through these are the if you have four out of the ten this is argued by the author if you have four out of these ten categories picked and you actually execute on them he states that your organization is likely to see at least a ten times gain now we don't have to go through all of this in order to determine if whether or not IOTA is. I mean, if you had bought IOTA when it came out and you bought it in the middle of the summer when it really dropped to like 15 cents, it's already gone 10 times. And the, the furthering of this is it's only a matter of time before it's going to be even greater. But we're not going to get there until we can start to develop on this platform and find more use cases. So today we're talking about healthcare and how I see it. But that's because if, if any of you are in the healthcare industry, if you're a doctor, a nurse, a pharmacist, or just a, if you're a patient and you're trying to get a prescription, you're trying to do, uh, you want to see your doctor and you can't, there's just so many barriers in order for you to get information from one location to another or from one you know, prescriber to another. For me, this represents an opportunity for facilitation of information or transfer of information, as well as just the paying process, how we're getting paid as far as from a pharmacy's perspective, how we're paying others when we submit for claims. I mean, there are certain things that you would expect that a pharmacy should be able to do, and we can't because we don't actually have any special access to information in our own computer system. So. Like I said, I'm not going to go into all of this because IOTA pretty much has 10 out of 10 on, on this scale. But here's an example. I put some examples of, of where it could fit. So cloud and community, meetups, the Slack channel, Telegram, Discord, you know, the investors. I'm sure a lot of you here have bought IOTA and you want to know what's up with the price. I mean, like that's got to be on everyone's mind, I'm assuming, because if you're anything like me, I mean, I want to know that too. Uh, some of the, the algorithms, this is continuously ongoing. Obviously, you have the, the foundational layer of the, the tangle, as well as Ben brought up uh, mass authenticated messaging. I can't stress enough that's, that's going to be crucial as far as how I see it can be implemented in the, in the healthcare industry. So it has something that you, you could think of. It's called forward secrecy. So he was discussing about how there's a channel and you give like a link to a radio stream, right? But if I'm a patient and I want the doctor to know this information, whatever it happens to be, and I want them to know at a different facility, then I can open up a channel with that person and say, you can see this for this long, and then it expires after your visit or whatever the conditions you, you allow for. Maybe it's an ongoing problem and you wanna be able to share the information that your oncologist has with your primary care physician, with any other prescriber out there. I mean, everyone thinks, I think to some degree, unless you've gone through the pains of the US healthcare system, you would never know how difficult it is just to get information from one doctor to another doctor in the same building. You know, you would think that that would be readily retrievable and yet it's not. And so uh, IOTA's massive transformative purpose, this is what the author again argues, is that you need to have a massive transformative purpose to get people behind an idea and make these exponential gains. And IOTA wants to be the backbone of the IOT industry. I swear this is backwards. And so this slide is just discussing what is the tangle. It talks about the different layers of it. And this is just from their website, so you guys can check out their site if you haven't already. But what I'm most interested in is this microtransactions, what this will allow us to do. And this is how mass authenticated messaging will fit its place into there. And it's everything as a service. Right now, we are still stuck with using... We're paying for physical things or physical services or whatever the case may be, but we haven't yet digitized everything. You know, everyone is seeing like there's a blockchain for everything, right? 
don't know if there's really a purpose for a majority of those blockchains that do that and do this and do this and one is marginally better than the other and then you find out that most of these blockchains don't even yet exist and they're just white papers and there's just all this nonsense out there but what is going to be important is can it actually function and be able to scale at these obscenely high levels of uh, number of transactions as well as the incredibly tiny level of transaction. I mean, you can, you can add a, a, a transaction onto the network without any iota value. I mean, that's, that's incredible. You can't do that with any other blockchain. Well, I don't know if there's other claims out there that they can, but as far as I know, they can't. All right, so this is a pyramid of the, you have data at the foundation, right? And we just, and Ben had discussed this, the power and the value of data. Um, so data is gathered, information is inferred from the data, knowledge is distilled from the information, and then wisdom is supervenient on that knowledge and can guide action in a variety of ways. So in 2017, the generation of more data than the previous 5,000 years combined. So this is where exponential and the zero like fee transactions are gonna become extremely important. Uh, the next decade will see over 75 billion connected devices that will interact, provide, store, and engage amongst themselves. So this is what the machine to machine economy is uh, going to be. So data is a limitless uh, is, is da limitless in supply. It's the basic unit of value for the connected machine economy. Trading data will be beneficial for all parties. And the goal is to make data free. So Ben had talked a little bit about data silos. And we'll talk about that again. Basically, it just is like, think of a silo, right? You have the grain, it's stored in there, and that's only reserved for the farmer that did that. You know, it's not like it's anybody's, but there is information out there where in the healthcare industry, we are feeding the pharma companies, we are feeding any other medical company all the information ever. This is way before Facebook, way before anyone else, Google was mining your data. The health industry has been mining it forever. You, you don't have access to that. Like really, who has their medical record? I don't think anybody really does. And so this is what making data free again means. It means that you own the data and you can choose to do whatever you want with it. If you want to sell it, you can go ahead and sell it. If you don't want to sell it, then don't sell it. But it should not be where it's a one-way street, where you are the person that is not only afflicted by these problems, but it's, it just burdens you. It's always the burden is on you. HIPAA, it stands for the Health Information Portability and Accountability Act. Portability and accountability was supposed to help people in order to transfer information, not make it more difficult. It's not even, if, if any of you guys are familiar with HIPAA, it's, it's not really that secure. If you call like an insurance company and you want to find out information on the plan, the policy, something, and you call and you say you are that person and all you need to know is their name and date of birth, you, sure, they'll give it to you. That is all that's required. If I tell them at the start of the phone conversation when I'm calling on a patient's behalf, they're like, all right, well, I can't tell you that. I'm like, they're right here. But it, they won't give you the information. You've got to hand the phone over to someone else. And it's like, it's ridiculous. It's absurd. Like, that's all they needed? All right, fine. Okay, yeah, you can give it to them. I get the phone back, and then I get the information that I was requesting for in the first place. So it just is, to me, it's a, it's a sense of doublespeak where they talk about how it's important to health information and privacy. To me, that just sounds like a way to stifle innovation, to restrict anyone from wanting to get their own information, and so that they're like, no, 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 you, don't, you shouldn't have that data. It's, don't worry about it. It's important, but you can't access it. And that's where I think there needs to be a dramatic change in, in healthcare. So we're just looking for, so this is where community comes into play. And I had seen there was a developer here that I had met like two weeks ago, literally two weeks ago, never heard of IOTA before. Within two weeks, he was able to perform something that I've been wanting to find if someone could do, and he's already done it. So this is where the benefit of these meetups and just sharing these ideas. I mean, this is none of this is real yet. 
It's not real yet because we haven't built it, but it's going to come and we're going to need ideas to fuel this innovation. Talking about your project. Iota is very much real. No, no, I know that. I'm talking, yes, Iota is real, correct. This is real. <laughs> I'm talking about, right, the, the future examples that I'm going to show and share with you guys uh, about what I think is going to happen. So I've talked a little bit about the, now we call abysmal U.S. healthcare system in desperate need of saving. Um, and if you are not aware, there is monopoly that is being played right now by a number, a handful, not a number, a handful of companies. And so when Ben had illustrated uh, with Jeff Bezos, launching this, you know, having this claim that he's going to start his own healthcare company, check out the stock prices of every major health corporation out there. You saw CVS go down. You saw Medco go down. Everyone is now freaking out about what is he going to do? Because when Jeff Bezos gets involved, he does very well. And if he's going to be applying these exponential organizational models, and he's going to be able to bring down the cost, it's going to eliminate all of that all of these data silos with all these private health information companies that are just, they're holding it and they're not, there's, there's no value to it. They can't sell that to anyone anyways. But that's the, that's the problem. This is potential value that could help benefit the entire population if it was properly assessed. And so I'm going to look a little bit into the innovation side of things. And these, these things are real. I guess i got to just show you. I'll tell you guys about what is not necessarily real. <laughs> so this is, uh, I want to walk you guys through a day in the life of a healthcare professional, specifically a pharmacist. And what I'm looking for is improved communications between the patient, provider, and the pharmacy. I'm also concerned with real-world data and modeled care based on that. So I had mentioned earlier that there was a developer that I had just met and was able to take information from your Fitbit and attach that to the Tangle. Now, I've had a Fitbit, I have a watch, I'm not wearing it, I'm not particularly the best person about wanting to do this, and I don't think that the Fitbit is going to somehow save medicine. What I am concerned with is other medical diagnostic information. So, for instance, diabetes. It's a growing epidemic around the country. We have people that are testing, supposedly, three times a day for their, their sugar levels. And yet, I can tell you just based on refill history that that is definitely not the case. But what if there was a way where every time you were to read your information, it would be attached to the tangle and now either you could privately hold it or you could sell it back to the data marketplace. And that's where I believe the innovation will come in. You're going to start to see a massive amount of information that is yet to have ever been witnessed before. The best sources of information for health studies have always been retrospective studies on a retrospective analysis on uh, studies that were conducted with either Medicare or Medicaid patients because they represent the largest transactional history of any set of population uh, of patients. So what if we could monetize and put every single transaction within someone's healthcare onto a distributed ledger? And that's where IOTA comes into play. So Andaman 7 is real. <laughs> this is a real company. What is not real is that we do not have uh, IOTA as a way or a means of paying for information. But what Andaman 7 is, is a universal platform that facilitates data exchange within the disparate sectors of healthcare to improve outcomes and increase reimbursements. What that means is like there is, uh, you can download the app. There's a way for you can, you can put your own medical record. You can download your medical record and store it on Andaman 7. But you can also share your physical activity. You can include people of your circle of trust. So if you're a parent and your child has certain drug allergies or just regular food allergies, you can also be like a co-author of their medical history and you can share that information uh, whenever necessary. And this becomes incredibly important if you were in some sort of emergent situation and you need information immediately and you can't wait and you don't even know where to turn if you needed to get this information. So having it available to you now would be extremely uh, advantageous in the time of crisis because when you're freaking out and you don't know what to do and you have it right in your pocket, it, it could be a difference between life and death. And I'm not saying that this is going to necessarily save your life, but 
This is uh, for those who do have to track and have very sick people that, that are in their life. And you, can't, you cannot know everything. You must have a way to retrieve this information. But where I see, this is what is not real. <laughs> this is where I see um, what will happen, right? So Ben's working on electronic medical records. And I can't stress enough, that is in, like very valuable information. So there, he mentioned HL7, and that was a standard protocol that supposedly the healthcare industry uses, but it's not the only standard protocol. There are a number of different standardized protocols that are used for different parts of healthcare, and they are not interoperable. In fact, there is like a, a huge conference coming up next week in Las Vegas called HIMSS. It's the biggest health IT conference, and the the, the focus of this event is going to be interoperability. Who's going to solve this problem? But it's talking about interoperability amongst like a centralized private company versus another privatized company and how they've found a way to bridge their data. That's all that that is. It's not actually interoperability. It is just two big players finding a way to send their information but keeping whatever they choose. So what I think will happen is if, if everyone had access to their own healthcare record and they're logging this automatically, if I had to log my own stuff, there's no way I'm doing it. You need a machine in order to be doing this. This is why a wearable would be ideal to do this with. And the financial benefit comes from by studying these patterns of use or non-use, you can find better ways in order to incentivize patients to be more adherent to their medication and therefore decrease the number of hospitalizations and all the side effects that come along with it. But then there's a way where we can use and leverage technology to make payments, like medical payments. And so this is a and this is a, this is something that we are working on right now. Um, it's called Health Card. It has RFID, NFC, uh, Bluetooth technology into it, and we have not yet got it so that it uses uh, IOTA's uh, token. However, that's the end goal, where we'll be able to make payments, just like you have. I don't know if you guys have a health or a health. If you guys have a hardware wallet you know, the cold storage wallet, like a ledger or something like that. I personally hate using that thing. I got to carry around a USB cord and then plug it in. They got to put in my numbers. Like that's not incredibly, you know, that's not convenient. I mean, I get it. It's supposed to be secure, but at that point, I, I don't understand why we have to have the wire. You know, they, they could have got rid of the wire. And this is where, this is a, a smart card. So it can store all these different pieces of information and it can transmit that information just uh, like I would assume think of it as like a like an Apple Pay you go up to the register the terminal you tap the card and you're out and this is also so this is I took a screenshot from the the Trinity wallet which is about to be launched and this is does not exist there isn't a health option yet <laughs> but what I would like to see is instead of just transactional information of financial statements it would be i don't know it would be awesome to me if i had a way of looking at my timeline of either my my wearable information my or my prescription information and within that you can encode you know monetary value as well as just you know medical diagnostic value this is where i think i have to speed things up here but i'm sorry Again, I don't represent Appreci Pharmaceuticals. I just <laughs> appreciate them. I think they have some ab absurd technology. Um, they were the first FDA-approved uh, company to produce a 3D-printed drug. Uh, the drug was already out. It's called Leviteracetin. It's known as Keppra. It's an anti-seizure medication. But what's cool about this, and this is what they got the FDA approval for was the zip dose technology. That's what it's called. And it's oral dispersible formulation. What that means is that it will dissolve uh, when you put it in your mouth. When it's a, a, around any sort of liquid, it will essentially dissolve rapidly. And it allows for the masking of really bad tasting medicine. And I don't have, I don't have any kids, but I know that parents have a very hard time getting their children to take medication. And something like your seizure meds 
you can't be missing those. You know, you can't miss that because the the outcome is so dramatic. It could potentially be, you know, a compromising of their well-being for the rest of their life. So I, the way I envision things and the way that I think that this will happen is you have machine learning and AI, right? You have a way of cryptographically securing that information and storing it on a distributed ledger. You have machines now, not machines, but these algorithms that are crunching these numbers and they're coming out with this gem of information and you're starting to reveal something that's beyond human identifiable patterns and we'll be finding solutions to problems that don't yet exist and that we never thought were possible we're going to have precision medicine to a patient level where whatever they take is going to be every single medication could be printed onto one tablet so adherence is going to be no longer an issue, uh, as well as you know, masking and making it easier for someone to take. All right, I got this. So concluding thoughts, adoption is critical. We need people to be voluntarily participating and we should have more channels of collaboration. People shouldn't be, I don't know, uh, worried or afraid to ask questions or want to get involved without knowing that much. I'm sure that you guys are experts in whatever field that you work in. And I'm sure that just like me, I, you know, I was working on an energy sensor and was like, oh my God, we could do this with drugs. We could be measuring what their, what their sugars are and we could figure out, you know, better ways to manage their therapy. And, and so like, this is where, I don't know, I'm reaching out to anyone that wants to continue to develop. And I encourage you guys to find people here that you want to work with. Find people at work that, you know, also think this way. And we live in New York. I mean, every resource is, like, available to us. I mean, money is here. That's most important. But the best minds in the world, uh, of the world, <laughs> best minds in the world converge in New York. So, you know, use this opportunity to branch out and find people that are smarter than you. And hopefully you learn something from them. So I just want to thank you guys. Sorry if I went long. And I want to give special thanks to Dan and Kevin, our hosts, and the IOTA Foundation. I'm sorry. Uh, one thing that kind of was spoken, but not like it was spoken around, but not really like uh, communicated. Um, you know, you look through both those presentations, you go, well, you know, we, we talk about distributed ledgers, we talk about, uh, we talk about decentralization, but why couldn't you just build this on a regular application, right? And the biggest difference is that when we say distributed ledger, it's kind of code for privacy, security, kind of owning your own data. That's really what we mean when we say distributed or decentralized uh, in this context. So, whereas Alexi could build this on a regular application, he'd just be competing with all these other people that, you know, when you look at Apple, I mean, you look at, um, like Apple's health initiative, they're storing that data and then they own it, right? So with the distributed ledger, you could have your own node, right? Where all this data is being collected and then you own it, right? It's stored on, um, you call it like a node, like you, you, it's stored on your computer and only you have access to it and you can determine how you want to use it. You can either send it or you can save it. So with all these new systems, they're called like D apps. So a D app is a, um, it's a decentralized application. You're going to start seeing them. 2018 is really like the year of D apps where applications are going to start coming out and you're not going to even know that they're using a tangle or that they're using a distributed ledger. So like if there was a distributed Facebook, and we'll get into Q&A if I'm like drawing on, uh, but I thought it was important. Um, you know, if you talk about like a distributed Facebook, a key, like if it looked exactly the same, but one was using like IOTA and one wasn't, the key difference is that all that data that they're um, accumulating about you, you would own that. So it wouldn't be stored on a centralized server that then they sell to advertisers, right? So you'd kind of, you'd have some sort of I don't know, place on your dashboard and you'd see, oh, like, here's all my data. Like, what do you want to do with it? Well, I want it to be private. I want it to be um, public. And the reason is because the data is stored locally, right? So, like, if, um, what was the big hack that happened? Equifax. Like, if Equifax had been on a distributed ledger, there wouldn't have been a centralized server to attack, right? Like, 
the data would have been distributed. So maybe they could like compromise your own personal computer, but that's one node out of millions. So it adds this level of protection and privacy and security that you really see. So that's what's really exciting about all these projects that are being built on the IOTA Tangle is that anything that you can imagine kind of in its current centralized form uh, will have a decentralized counterpart in the future. So that's kind of, that's kind of like the big, big, big takeaway. It's like, oh, I could use a centralized service that my data, I'm just creating data and then it's, you know, stored, stored somewhere. Or if I use uh, Alexi's um, uh, service, then I control it, I keep it, I get to say how it's used. So that's like, a, that's a really big distinction. And as, as we have more uh, people coming, like next month, we're going to have someone from the Iota Foundation fund. Uh, and he's going to be talking about how he's funding projects like this, right? Uh, so it's, it's not just healthcare, it's really all areas and all aspects. So. I don't know. So what is the difference? Uh, like, what is the advantage of IOTA uh, uh, compared to Ethereum or BitShares? Or so IOTA doesn't have fees, correct? But then, like, as far as I know, they all have bugs, right? So, have you, um, like, what would be the difference? Like, if you put the same data on Ethereum or BitShares or EOS? Or sure, I got this. Yeah. For now, I might need you to come in. Uh, so one of the key differences, right? So IOTA actually isn't a blockchain. So Bitcoin's a blockchain, Ethereum's a blockchain, and there's this proof of work mechanism where you're paying miners for transactions, right? So Bitcoin, it could cost $5 per transaction. It could be 30 cents per transaction on Ethereum, right? It doesn't sound like a lot, right? I'm sure that there are gonna be blockchains that can beat that model and make it less expensive. The problem is when you're dealing with IOT, and you're sending billions of packets of data throughout the day, like Bosch, for example. So Bosch is leveraging IOTA within its network of IoT devices. Bosch can't send packets of data between billions of devices for 30 cents a piece. It'd get very expensive very quickly. With IOTA, it's feeless. So I can send packets of data and it doesn't cost anything. So that's really exciting kind of from a, from a scalability point of view, but also just from an economic point of view. Uh, the second thing is that blockchains have a hard time scaling because more people that use it it's you're jamming more transactions into a block, right? And then you're actually creating more blocks. Is this right? Am I good so far? Yeah. I'm just, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like with the DAG, it's, it's actually separate nodes that as more people use the network, it actually increases, not congests the network. So even though IOTA doesn't have um, co smart contracts yet, there will be smart contracts in um, probably by the end of the year, potentially with a project called Peak. Um, what's really cool is that when smart contracts are on the IOTA network, it's actually going to make it faster, whereas what you saw with like CryptoKitties on Ethereum, it actually congested the network. Um, so it's kind of like a, a big, big difference. Anything else? Before we end? Yeah, yeah. sorry, lots of you questions. Have the second mic around so we can get... Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Could you talk briefly about um, Edge? Because uh, unless I missed it, it was just mentioned, but not really explained. Simulated. We can talk Okay, that's, that's too peripheral. Thanks. Well, I'm going to for you someone that's going to give you better information. Sure. Thank you. So you guys said that IOTA does not have any proof of work, and you guys uh, introduced no, 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 your own. I didn't, I didn't see that. It's just done a little differently. It's done. It's through the curl hash function, right? The one. Curl for, for transactions. So whatever, every it, it's done on your local machine, whereas, uh, rather than a miner doing it. So if you're sending out a transaction, if you're receiving a transaction, you have to verify two transactions. So it's a little more centralized. Yes, and at the same time, no one can confirm uh, their own transactions. So that way, we, we keep it kind of trustless. So the uh, proof of work done in IOTA, it's actually a complete different functionality than the one in blockchain, where in a blockchain, the proof of work is a, uh, is a consensus mechanism. I'm a, I'm a cryptographer. I, I know proof of work and hash functions. OK. Whereas uh, for IOTA, it's more for as a way to, as a way to uh, like, uh, prevent uh, anti-spam attacks. Or kinds of like prevent, f kind of slows down the uh, amount of spam. Okay. Thank you.
I have uh, two questions. One's brief, I think. Uh, with that future card, is your uh, roadmap to put a ternary processor on that chip, or how are you going to do the proof of work? No. For I mean, I, I not hardware specific. That would be a, that would be yeah. the focus and the goal. Ideally, we would want to standardize all the devices that are going to be on the in the next IoT revolution to have that. Now, I don't know of many manufacturers that are looking to do that. Aside from Gen Labs, I know is working on ternary processing. So even taking that out of the equation, the, the proof of work, the concept is to have the, a payment processor do it? You would want to be able to use the card to facilitate, like, just like you could, just like you could, is this on? All right, just like you could transact uh, with the ledger, let's say, you would be able to transact and pay with this card by using its wireless technology you know that feature to facilitate the transaction. That's that's the way I see it happening. Like I said, I'm not the developer, so I can't give you how that is going to work. All I know is that it's being worked on. Okay. And then the second question is a little more big picture to zoom out a little bit. Um, I agree completely with all the inefficiencies in healthcare, and it's a market ripe for disruption. But I wonder about the ability to implement from bottom up decentralized strategy. I, 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 to, in order to disrupt it, it almost feels like you need someone like that 800 pound gorilla, like Amazon, to acquire yeah, one. I mean, companies, I, right? I agree. I think for the point of, for the, yeah, for the point so of, I was wondering if that was the strategy is acquisition well, by. You want to find as many partners, people that power users, you know, you want to find someone that is going to be able to just mass apply this technology yeah. and then, it needs to be taught down but the entrenched players have they have no interest in, in why would they so <laughs> well, here's where it gets tricky too a lot of these aren't companies so like iota is not a company right nonprofit foundation theory is, so like it, I, I don't think amazon's gonna like be acquiring a theory of any time. no 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 i mean i mean these individual outfits oh, okay, got it, got it. My, i hope because i really is that heap uh, the feds actually say let's do something with dlt yeah, you either if need they do that. You either Ooh. need regulation from Washington, or you need to be acquired by a power player in the space, right? Yeah, and so really, to be honest, this all this healthcare stuff is just sleeper right now. It's wow, we can really do that until somebody actually makes that little move. It means nothing. But at the moment, someone at that level in the government says, "Yeah, let's look at that." Boom, whole universe puzzle. So I'm not. I'm part of the IOTA Evangelist Network and not the IOTA Foundation. So if anyone from the IOTA Foundation is watching and hopefully don't get upset with me. Uh, but that's kind of what one of why I think what's so unique about the IOTA Foundation in particular, rather than a lot of these other uh, plot projects, is that they're working so closely with industry with that in mind. So like if you look at what they're doing with Bosch, if you look at what they're doing with Fujitsu, uh, with uh, a lot of these automobile companies that they're partnering with, they're creating these open protocols with these behemoth companies. So like... I don't know exactly. I know that there is a whole healthcare group like Miguel, who was part of the Outer Foundation. He's working with like a, uh, he's also I am, uh, like a 14 person group that's committed to development and outreach. And there, I think that Iota has it the right way where you're right. Like, I think a lot of these projects, they're just building the protocol and hoping people like get on board. And I think in 2018, that's not going to work. I think that you have to have connections and, and relationships in the industry, which is kind of, well, I, I've seen it very much so in like, the automobile uh, kind of like IoT area, but not so much in healthcare, but maybe there's something happening behind the scenes that I don't know about. Yeah, I guess that was my question is I see the enterprise adoption happening in automotive, but in other sectors, I haven't heard or read much and maybe it's behind the scenes and it just hasn't been announced yet. But yeah, I mean, I'm not aware of that, but I think that this is, you hear about those, those connections because someone does it. That's, you know, that's how it happens. Someone just goes, they make that connection with, these, that's what IOTA Foundation is using all this technology for. They want others to build on this, and then they want you to bring partnerships. You get, you bring your industry to IOTA, or you know, vice versa. That's the that's the way I see it. Like, it, like I said, I looked into IOT, and it all of a sudden just like it spoke pharmacy to me. Even though that's only because that's my lens. But for someone else, that I don't I have no idea what everyone out, out here is doing for work. But I guarantee you, you're all thinking. Wow, if I, maybe I could apply this to my certain industry, it would make this better. Like mostly, if you if you're not exposed to the medical industry, then you would never know my problems. But like I deal with facts. Here I am talking about billions of internet connected devices, and the only legal way for me to send another 
piece of medical information is by a fax. I mean, this is absurd. I can't even use an email. It's not within the law to do so. So I need to use a fax machine. It's like we were burdened by just like this archaic, antiquated use of legacy systems that needs to just be we got to be done with this. I mean, I, I don't understand how fax is still a relevant thing. It's like you said, it's right for disruption. But there Absolutely. has to be buy-in from above. Yeah. But there's so much frustration out there. Particularly it's, in health. It's going to happen. Yeah. It's gonna well, happen. one thing to keep it what? Okay. Well, last thing to that, one thing to keep in mind, too, is that um, the uh, education of the consumer is going to grow exponentially in the next two years. And I think that data and privacy is going to become at the forefront. Once you once you start working with applications, that's like, oh, you mean I can hold my own data? I can pack my own data. Oh, what does that actually mean? I think it's actually going to, it is going to be down up a little bit. The in that EU is really ahead of us on that with GDPR, and it's good that they're based in Germany, I think. Yeah. So but you're going to start to see consumers getting way more educated about it, and then know it, like demanding it. And I think then that that's maybe a, a, a down up approach as well. That we can see. Yeah. Uh, so this is a more technical question. Um, so. We talked about uh, uh, so we talked about IoT and how IOTA is um, helping machines communicate to a uh, uh, different machines. Um, that's uh, really really fascinating. And what happens? Um, let's say uh, something happens to a group of let's say um, some machines that are communicating uh, through IOTA. Something happens and they can't connect to the um, uh, the broader network. Uh, so what happens to the communication among those devices? Uh, so Examples could include um, charging stations and Volkswagen cars, um, but somehow the, they can't connect to the network. So do they have their own network? Like, like they, they broke off from the uh, main, main, main network, which is the main Tango. Mm -hmm. so, so what happens here is um, a, a real, another fundamental principle for uh, IOTA, which is that it is a partition tolerant. Since uh, IOTA, it's a continuous stream of transaction, and it's not of, and then it doesn't have like like it's not really uh, sensitive to time stamping. What 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 happens is that um like those uh like devices when they break off the network they continue to uh, make transactions they create their own offline tango, but whenever they get back online then they, their transactions will end up just getting reattached to the main net and then incoming transactions would then start to validate theirs as well. Thank you. I want to go back to uh, the healthcare and major players. Aren't we all supposed to disrupt these major players and the government itself with cryptocurrencies and initiate peer-to-peer transactions and data structures and data handling without all of this? So why do we need another major player or another ICO to do the same thing, to add to it? Or to, be, to be acquired by Amazon or uh, another uh, powerful uh, healthcare company that, that will pretty much control your data again. I agree. And in a lot of sectors, it's bottom up. However, unfortunately, healthcare is, you know, it's hospitals, it's doctors, it's all that. So it has to be involved with the government on some level. And, and that's not really. We need to leverage the community's uh, power, not the government power. I mean, they have enough leverage so far, and I'm not... I mean, I don't have any. I don't share any data with uh, with any uh, with any uh, corporation or any uh, uh, any government. But I'm very meticulous about that. But don't we all can uh, able to? Aren't we able to um, work on something together and create something together with one community behind IOTA or Ethereum, whatever it is, and bypass all those major players who are, who hold the power and take it back within our hands? That's what you guys want to do, right? Uh, I got it. Trying to develop was in rural Guyana with a Guyanese doctor. So these are these Amerindian communities in the middle of nowhere. I'm, a, I'm from Africa. It's Sorry, not in the middle of nowhere, it's somewhere in this. In the, I'm from Africa, North Africa. Oh, no, no, Guyana. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, okay. It, so I'm saying these places are not in the middle of nowhere. Let's not refer right, to it's countries not who are. I, I know it's not. They're, they're, they're unconnected to I'm saying, the internet. Let's, let's not refer to countries where uh, we insinuate that they are left behind when they are actually not. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. I just meant they're not connected to any network. That's what I meant. That's all I meant. Sorry. Bad bad language. But the point being, they're not on the 
And, and, yeah, because yeah, this is a trend in the community. Right. Everybody's taking Africa and Guyana and Mexico and places like that as an That's example right. where they actually are not the best example. Maybe the US is a better example. Do you, have you heard of Project Loon? No. Project Loon, uh, Google is having these big blimps. They were used in Puerto Rico recently after the big hurricanes to get internet connection back. And they've recently put a bunch of new satellites around the equator and Facebook had its whole drone plan where they wanted to beam the internet into these uh, isolated communities, isolated that is, they're hard to get to. And um, the idea is that maybe you can leapfrog a lot of the problems that you were just referring to with this new revolutionary tangled technology so that people, like you said, in, within their communities can grow their own community-based, community-focused, community-driven healthcare that really, since it's since with the distributed ledger, you don't need any central control. And in a country like the USA, you're just, see again, I, when I say leapfrog, it's because in, you know, in these communities that currently don't have any internet connection, there's no sort of overarching power that's gonna describe, decide how things should be. But when they're in the United States, it's all integrated, you know, the government control is very... Is, this thing was designed not to be stopped. So, I, I'm with so you. what's stopping us from doing it? I'm with you. I'm with you, right? Well, the problem is, it's like, are you going to develop a community effort for a standard, a, a medical standardization? Protocol. You need, you need, there are medical governing bodies that have been in place for hundreds of years, or very close to that, and that's only been the, like, to the benefit of society. So there's information and there's just intrinsic knowledge that we should all agree upon and we should leave it to those who are most expert in those fields to agree upon that. So there is a reason why we would want to work with other governing bodies and those who are going to be managing millions of people's health care. So there is a reason for like uh, alliance and for cooperation. We, we're not able to do this independently. I, in my opinion, it is to be, you know, we're, you're not going to get like a, uh, you know, independently opened hospital. You know, you're going to you're going to require on a country's ability to provide these municipal services, and so we should rely also on the experts' advice on how we're going to implement these changes. And then after that, you can let the machines figure out new algorithms and new patient care pathways that we won't ever have imagined. But we can't get there until we start collecting that information and distributing it. We can't allow for a company just to hold information and not share it. This is where you share this information because you're bettering. If you have a disease and you have a great outcome, then you can show the rest of the world what worked. Versus right now, you, you can't. No, one, no one's going to know or care necessarily unless you do a study. You got a question over here? Thank you. I think... Uh, a lot of the reason why people are here is to understand the protocol better and also your question with the proof of work. I think if that can be explained a little bit better uh, by you guys and I can also help, I think I understand it well enough, is that the proof of work that you do client side is also you choose the tip that you select to and the proof of work algorithm is really just to prevent civil attacks and spam attacks. and that's what makes it scale, is that there's no competition for the blocks and it doesn't increase the fees because there are no fees, you just do it yourself. Um, I don't know if you guys want to add something to that. I have a question about the dApps and also about Peak. Um, if you had a startup like Twitter coming into the, you know, coming in now, could they uh, run it on on, as a DApp on, on a Tangle? Um, so you're saying that whether, uh, if Twitter's interested, whether they can adopt, they can adopt IOTA? Yeah, or if they could yeah. start, you know. Yeah, um, uh, yeah um, so IOTA is free and open source, and anyone can uh, start using IOTA technology. They don't need uh, IOTA's foundation's uh, um, permission. But I mean, uh, technically, could they scale to millions of users uh, using the uh, IOTA? Um, 
I, 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 let me see. Are you talking about the the number of nodes that they create, or um, like the well, I don't. Uh, since, since I'm not I'm not technical, um, you know, as Twitter is now, for example, to use them mm -hmm. as, as an example, um, w would would it be feasible for them instead of having their servers to to to, to be totally decentralized? Uh, so you're thinking about creating like like Twitter creating some kind of like a fork of uh, IOTA Tango, like creating their own uh, like private Tango that they. That I, they well, well, the, in, I'm I'm just using Twitter as an example, but mm -hmm. like a, like a social media app with millions of users, an event would start small mm -hmm. and then build up and go viral, and then would be on using the Tango instead being totally decentralized. Is that a feasible concept or? I don't think it's doable on a blockchain, but I'm wondering if it's doable on the on the Tangle. It's already on blockchain. I'm sorry. Steam it. Yeah, Steam it yeah. is on the blockchain. Yeah, it's already done. So, so is that can that can that scale? I don't know how big. I think, Steam. I think where Kevin's hesitating is like, yes, it is technically feasible. I think that in the next like four or five months, just because of how fast the network is, it's going to take some time as like more nodes are available. Yeah. But yes, like it very much is possible. To Ev eventually, it, 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 there's a model that, that you could you could build it now. Um, you could use like for example, Oyster, right? Oyster is a protocol that um, replaces ads on websites with uh, currency to earn currency. They're using IOTA. Um, it's distributed ledger for I think, like transactions, but then they're also leveraging like ERC twenty capabilities, um, uh, like Ethereum smart contracts. So you can kind of run on uh, There is a Twitter messaging app already. Uh, you know, looking at the code and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and it's, as you see, Bill's messaging app using mass authentication messaging. But what's interesting, I think, it's about the TPS. If you have very high TPS, IOTA is very weird because the other blockchains will slow down the more traffic there is. IOTA actually speeds up because each transaction has to confirm to other transactions. So what you're talking about, absolutely in a high TPS environment. Yeah. Transactions per second. Yeah. There's like a chicken or egg situation. It's like more as more people go on, the faster it gets, but it's not going to get faster. Yeah. More people come on. I think ultimately it's when uh, like. It can like many people could use it once they are able to like pass the real, really hot, like the learning curve of actually trying to understand how IOTA uses and making all these uh, different transactions. And my, my other question is about Peak. I understand that the IOTA Foundation is reviewing Peak, and uh, does it look like P that there's going to be a kind of ERC twenty capability that Peak would make it possible for private companies to have a, a coin? So um, the purpose of Peak is uh, Peak is trying to create a uh, second layer uh, smart contract system on top of the IOTA Tango. Although, um, so th there is used to create uh, color coins, for example, um, uh, like uh, coins that have that are more that have like different functionalities that they that that um, the IOTA token doesn't have. For example, it's backed by certain assets or equity. Yeah, but in terms of the roadmap, um, they're still under review. Okay. One, la one last question. So, so I know we're, we do want to have some like hangouts and chat. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to know, like, do you see in the future uh, communities that have problem affording machines? Will they be able to afford your your machines and help their by owning their data? Uh, I think it's going to be incredibly cheaper. I think that's what this era of abundance we're going to be entering is going to be all about. It's going to get, everything's going to get exponentially cheaper with time. So like 3D printing, that's going to come down in cost and that's also going to bring down the cost of products. But even the technology that we have, um, it's already gotten incredibly cheap. I mean, there are like tablets that you can get for like 10 bucks or that, that's what it, the actual cost is to produce these things. So. Um, you know, it's highlighted in this in this book. I can't I don't read much, but I'm telling you, this is a good book to read. Um, and he discusses about how there's a tablet where, like, they can they they've got it down to like ten dollars per tablet that you can purchase. But it's going to get to a point where it's not going to even make sense to even bill anyone for it, and you're just going to start giving them away because you want them to use the tablet so that you can market whatever other idea you wish you know to project. So. Yeah, I think that the, the beauty with IoT is going to be, I, essentially, you were going to expect that it's not even there. It's going to be built into the day where you don't even realize that it's doing something. It's collecting something, information somewhere. I mean, 
Bluetooth and all this. These are little tiny chips. They are very, this is cheap technology. Cool. Uh, I think I think we've had plenty of questions. Uh, I think we should do like a little like mingling now because I know like one of the coolest parts about these uh, kind of connections is that we can all chat and like we're a pretty like diverse really interesting group of people. So I always want to make sure that we have a couple, uh, we are, uh, we have some time to like connect and chat. So, um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.